All right, we're, um, we are uh, going to get going. Um, uh, welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming. Uh, for those who I have not yet met, because uh, we uh, welcomed our new students this semester, my name is Sandra Galea. I have the privilege of being the Dean of the School of Public Health. This is uh, part of our Dean's Seminar series, which is our roughly monthly um, uh, Dean's Seminar, which features um, a prominent speaker talking about an issue of contemporary concern. This uh, speaker series complements our Public Health Forum, which we do on uh, Wednesday afternoons, which is a more, more scholarly um, uh, discussion by a leading scholar around the topic. Uh, this uh, seminar series is usually uh, moderated by Dean Harold Cox, who is our uh, Dean of Practice, and I am going to turn it over to Harold to introduce our speaker. Harold. Good morning, everybody. Let me tell you about a couple of upcoming events that you will not want to miss. Uh, our next Dean Seminar is going to be on immigration and immigration reform and the politics around that. And Ali Narani will be here. Ali is one of our graduates from the School of Public Health and is now a key policymaker in Washington. So you won't want to miss that. Also, if you have not signed up, I encourage you to sign up now for the seminar that will happen on February 3rd, which is a seminar will, that will address the intersection between criminal justice, race, and public health. It's a day-long seminar um, right here in Hebert, and you will not want to miss it. There are some fantastic and outstanding speakers who will be here, um, including Dr. Mary Bassett, who is the Commissioner of New York City, uh, as well as Carnell Brooks, who is the president of the NAACP, Andrea Cabral, who is our former uh, sheriff, and a number of other individuals who you will know, and I encourage you, if you've not signed up, to sign up. We need to know who's going to be there, so um, be, be certain to, um, to sign up for it. So those are the uh, I, I, um, things that you will want to know that are coming up in the future. So last night, um, I had, uh, I went home kind of late after something I was doing, and, and I called home, and I spoke with my mother, and we had to talk about some family stuff. And then during the part of the conversation, I said, and you know, I just came back from dinner with Wendy Davis. And suddenly the conversation stopped, <laughs> and, and my mother, who lives in Texas, said, you mean the Wendy <laughs> Davis. Yeah, ma. So uh, there was nothing else that we talked about what I needed to talk about, but I was schooled about Senator Davis. So I am so very glad that the Wendy Davis is with us today. Um, Senator Davis certainly became nationally known because of the, um, the, the, the what she did around standing up for the issues of, of women's rights and thinking about putting a, a stop on a very, piece, a, a very important piece of legislation that was going to happen in Texas. That's when she became most well known in thinking of, in helping us to, 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 to uh, ensure that this piece of legislation about abortion was not going to pass. But she's been involved in policy and a number of different issues. And as I was schooled about her last night by, by my mother, um, I also learned that, that Senator Davis has some issues and interest in the issues of equal pay for equal work. That she'd also been involved in helping to forge a compromise between the oil and, and gas industry and a local community as they were dealing with some issues around getting certain minerals out of the ground. Senator Davis was also very involved in thinking about some issues around consumer protection, issues with the financial institutions and the public utilities in Texas, as well as someone who was a champion for efforts uh, about uh, suppressing uh, voter, voter, mm -hmm. voter rights, as well as the senator was very instrumental in, in the passage of a piece of legislation that had to do with testing a large number of, um, of, of rape kits that had not been tested. 
These are critically important, and these are very important issues. And, and this week, as we celebrate two important holidays, two important birthdays, Roe v. Wade and also the birthday of Martin Luther King, we are reminded of the importance of speaking out. Senator Davis has been someone who has spoken out, and today she's with us. Please join me in welcoming Senator Davis. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Dean, thank you for inviting me to be here and to our associate dean. Thank you. And thank your mother for that rounding <laughs> endorsement. I appreciate it very much. I admit to having stacked the audience today with a couple of people who worked with me on my campaign and they cannot help but be my fans and I cannot help but be their fans because we worked so hard together every day trying to do something very difficult in the state of Texas, which was to elect a statewide Democrat for the first time since Ann Richards was sworn into office back in 1990. Sadly, we did not succeed, but they've gone on to do bigger, better, wonderful things, and I can't wait to see what their futures hold. But Catherine Etman, who is here with the School of Public Health, and Kate Froelich, who is now getting her Master's in Divinity and Social Work, right, Kate? Um, so they're going to be the future voices of so much of what we see happening on progressive issues in this country. I have no doubt about it. So I wanted to talk with you about how it is that we can use our feet and our voices to change the world. And I'll start by just reminding us of something that we probably all did when we were young, or maybe we have children who did this. It's very natural when we're little that we step into the shoes of people that we admire. I know that both of my daughters did this with my high heel shoes when they were growing up, and I am very thankful that their feet outgrew mine because I probably would have no shoes in my closet if that had not been the case. These, of course, were shoes that I wore on a day that was important to me, fighting to give a voice to people who were not being heard in the Texas legislature. And in wearing them, I became known as an advocate for women. But I'm an advocate for so many other causes as well. And I've come to understand the importance of what it means to consider the experiences of other people and to step into their shoes to become a fighter and a voice for causes that are important to them. Historically, this is something that has happened in America. And in fact, this slide, I think, is a really good evidence of a time when that happened about 95 years ago, when women were given the right to vote with the passage of the 19th Amendment. They had to rely, of course, on men who were in office in order to give them that power. And as the story goes, there was one needed vote, a final congressional holdout, whose mother literally said to him, don't come home for dinner if you don't vote for the passage of this bill. And ultimately, it did pass, and of course, the rest is history. Today, like every day in our history, speaks to the fact that it's important for us to consider the experiences of others to step into their shoes and to fight for causes that are important to them. This is the Earl Warren Supreme Court. Nine white men who were instrumental in passing not only desegregation of our public schools, but so many other equal rights laws or the upholding of those laws in order to provide more equal voices for people in this country. What you notice when you look at this picture, of course, is their shoes, all men, and again, as I said, all white. Earl Warren, of course, led this court to do some extraordinary things, but what was it about Earl Warren that led him to be the person that he was? Earl Warren actually was appointed to the Supreme Court by President Eisenhower in 1952, 
before Eisenhower was elected, he was considered one of his strongest possible opponents for that presidential race. He was the governor of California. He negotiated with Eisenhower an agreement that he would step aside and deliver the delegates from California as best he was able to do that for Eisenhower in that election with the understanding that when the first opening on the Supreme Court came available, he would be given that slot. Well, not very long after President Eisenhower was elected, really not very long, just within a, a few weeks, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, Fred Vinson, unexpectedly died in his sleep. And when Earl Warren reminded Eisenhower of his commitment, he reminded him that he was promised the first opening. And because that opening happened to be the Chief Justice opening, he expected to be given that position, and he was. Now, later on, it's rumored that Eisenhower said that his appointment of Earl Warren to the Supreme Court was one of the worst things that he ever did. I consider it, of course, one of his greatest achievements. This is Ruby Bridges on her first day of school in Louisiana, two days after the desegregation order was put in place. And of course, accompanied by federal marshal marshals because Louisiana, like other southern states, had refused to follow the order of the Supreme Court. In order for Ruby to be able to walk into that school that day, Earl Warren had to step into her shoes and he had to convince his fellow justices to do the same. So where did that come from for Earl Warren? For him, a pivotal moment in his life was when he was Attorney General for California and he was tasked with carrying out the order by FDR to inter, inter Japanese Americans into camps. He wrote about it in his autobiography that after helping to implement that order and visiting the camps and seeing the human injustices that had occurred, families that had been ripped apart one from the other, children and women separated from fathers and husbands. It was an experience that he deeply regretted and something that stayed with him for the rest of his life. Because of that, he was able to convince the rest of the court to support the desegregation of our public schools in the case of Brown versus Board of Education in 1954. That case was actually already pending when he came to the court and he had a 5-4 decision in place already, but he knew that because this decision was going to be so difficult and against the backdrop of a country that wasn't necessarily friendly to what that decision would be, that a unanimous decision of the court was essential. And he worked with the four would-be dissenters month by month by month until he was able to convince them to place themselves through some experiences in their own lives into the shoes of the young people who deserved an equal education in this country. This, of course, is Justice Anthony Kennedy, of course, in a much more recent, very important decision, authored the Obergefell case, which allowed finally for marriage equality in this country. Now, he was appointed in 1988 by Ronald Reagan, Irish Catholic, brought up in a very conservative household with very conservative values. So what was it about Justice Kennedy that allowed him the ability to step into the shoes of others and to understand and relate to the experiences that they have? And to write these words, they ask for equal dignity in the eyes of the law. The Constitution grants them that right. Considering the dignity of people whose lives and life experiences were different from his own, Many people believe that that was because of his friendship with this man, Gordon Schaber, who was the dean of the law school that Justice Kennedy taught at for many years, who became not only his mentor, but one of his closest friends, and who was also gay. And when it came time for him to consider the human dignity of those who were before him 
at the Supreme Court, there's no doubt that Gordon Schaber, who had since passed, was weighing heavily on his mind. Sometimes we find ourselves in the shoes of other people that we would never have chosen to walk in. And that is true of these two women, Robbie Damlin and Bushra Awad, our two people on opposite sides of a very bitter conflict in their home states of Israel and Palestine. When I heard them speak at the Women in the World Conference in New York a few years ago, I was struck by their ability to come together in their shared grief and to try to forge a friendship that would be a part of forcing change. But I was really struck by their shoes. <laughs> they were both wearing these black and white Converse tennis shoes that they wore symbolically to demonstrate the fact that they literally, both having lost sons in the conflict, were now wearing each other's shoes. They are part of something called the family circle, the cir wait, wait, family, the parent circle family forum, uh, which is a group of about 600 Israeli and Palestinian families, each of whom have lost a loved one to the conflict, and each of whom wears these shoes as a symbolic gesture to the shared pain and the ability to work together that they now have. You, of course, probably remember the shoes that I wore on that particular day, but before I put those pink tennis shoes on that morning and stood on the Senate floor to fight for something important to me, my life was shaped by the experiences of having understood the shoes that those who came before me wore. This is a picture of my maternal grandmother, half Native American. She and my grandfather were always struggling financially. She understood the double sting of both racism and poverty. In a pair of hand-me-down old leather lace-up shoes when she was only 13 years old, she traveled across the Texas Panhandle and married my grandfather, who was only 15 at the time, in Arkansas, where they were allowed at that young age to marry. They traveled back across the Panhandle two years later with my Uncle Will in their arms, the first of their 14 children that they were to have. And they were tenant farmers for almost their entire lives. They didn't purchase their first home until they went on Social Security. It was the first time in their entire lives that they'd had a stable enough income to actually be able to buy a home. My mom, one of their 14 children, only two girls out of 14, <laughs> talks about having worn her brother's hand-me-down shoes as she worked every single day in the task of trying to care for a family that large, cooking, churning butter, washing their denim overalls, hours and hours and hours of standing were my mom's life as she grew up. And then when she and my father divorced when I was young, my mom became a single mom to four children and became our sole financial support. She had only a ninth grade education and I watched her struggle to provide for all of us. She worked at an ice cream and dairy store called Brahms and this orange and white uniform is something that forms an indelible part of my memory about her. But more so than this uniform, what I remember about my mom are these shoes. <laughs> these orthopedic, they call them comfort shoes, <laughs> in which, again, she would stand for hours and hours and hours in the work of scooping ice cream, flipping burgers, doing inventory, closing up the store at night, mopping the floors. She worked so incredibly hard. And I suppose my ability to stand for that many hours that day on the Texas Senate floor came in large part because of what she taught me. This is a picture of me when I was very young, and now you see that I am not a natural blonde. <laughs> this is my daughter, Amber. Um, I had her when I was very young. I was 19 years old. And it wasn't long after I had her that she, uh, that I separated from her father and became her sole financial support. 
And for a time, it looked as though my life was going to be very much like the life that my mother had lived. I didn't have access to higher education and didn't really even know how to have that dream for myself. But ultimately, because I was struggling so much financially, and thanks to literally an angel who mentioned a program at our community college to me, I found my way into community college. That community college saved me and put me on a path to creating a better life for myself and my daughter. But it wasn't just that community college that did that for me. It was also a Planned Parenthood clinic very close to where I lived. When I was this age and for the next year and the next and the next, that Planned Parenthood clinic was my only source of health care. I had no health insurance. And had it not been for them, and had it not been for the contraceptive care that I received there, I have no doubt that I likely would have had a second unplanned pregnancy, and it would have completely derailed my opportunity to create a better life for myself and my daughter. So you probably understand now why the two filibusters that I conducted in the Texas Senate, the first to try to stop public education funding cuts there, the second to try to stop an assault on reproductive rights in our state were so very personal and very important to me. So what about you? I had so much fun last night with the dean, the associate dean, some of your professors and others from the school talking about the School of Public Health and the temperament, the values that the students bring to the table, the desire to do so much good in the world. And it's typical of the what's known as millennial generation, that group of people from 18 to 33 year olds. You have this unbelievable capacity to consider other people's experiences. You've already demonstrated your understanding and your ability to put your feet into other people's shoes and to try to work to affect a change for the better in their lives. A recent poll showed that 92% of you want to have a positive effect in the world, and that is very unique to your generation. I wish I could say that it were true of mine when I was your age, but it simply wasn't. You get involved in so many causes beyond those that affect your personal day-to-day -day lives with the young women pictured here in the Black Lives Movement who do not fit within that particular ethnic category, racial category, but who have worked very hard to help be a part of that change. Emma Solkowitz here shown on the Columbia campus carrying her dorm room mattress with her every single day her senior year at Columbia in order to make a statement about sexual assault and what she felt was her campus's failure, the administration's failure to do something about an experience with sexual assault that she had had there. And then down at the bottom left of the screen, Sadie Hernandez, who is a young woman from Texas, who took it upon herself a few months ago to stage a protest outside the governor's mansion about cuts to Planned Parenthood, specifically cuts to cancer screening. She's from the Rio Grande Valley in Texas, and this isn't something that impacted her particularly, but she knew that it would impact so many of the women in her home community who relied on that care as their only source of health care. All people who have demonstrated the ability to stand up and to fight for things that they believe in. Sometimes, People in your generation get very, very involved in political campaigns as well. And this is one of my favorite pictures taken at the University of North Texas campus during my particular campaign. We had so many enthusiastic young people involved in our race. And of course, this picture, which for me epitomizes really why the day of that reproductive rights filibuster in Texas became the day that it became. It wasn't because of me. 
It was because of the thousands of people who showed up at the Capitol, not only that day, but in the days prior, who stood for hours and hours and hours and hours waiting to be called upon in committee hearings so they could share their personal stories about why this anti-abortion bill was so harmful to women's health. People who were willing to leave their day-to-day -day responsibilities and come and use their voices on behalf of women who they knew might one day walk in shoes that they had once walked in in confronting that particular decision. What you may know about that particular night was that it was not me that carried the filibuster successfully over the midnight deadline. It was those folks who showed up it was a record number of people in the Texas Capitol. They actually had to close it for the first time in history because it was filled to capacity. And as I was speaking that day on the floor, I could literally feel the building coming alive with the people and their voices that they were exercising out in the hallways and on the lawn. At about 11.45 p.m., after a long debate about parliamentary maneuverings and a decision about whether, indeed, my filibuster had been justly called to an end, one of my female colleagues, Leticia Vandepute, rose and asked the question, at what point is a woman's voice or her raised hand to be recognized over those of her male colleagues in the room? And what she said captured the audience who'd been sitting so respectfully all day as they watched the rules of order being broken in order for the Republicans to accomplish their goals on the floor. And they rose and they screamed, literally using their voices until they were able to get that bill past the midnight deadline because the Secretary of the Senate was not able to take the vote in time. They truly that day embodied what it means to step into the shoes of other people, to come and use your voices and to help be a part of making change. And what's extraordinary, unfortunately, even though that bill ultimately was called back in another special session and passed, was that they left a mark that continues to this day with people who now are more and more active in fighting for reproductive rights and who are willing to share their own stories and use their voices in order to try to help make sure that that happens. So I ask myself still to this day, what might be different if I were to place my shoes, my feet, excuse me, into someone else's shoes? And I hope you'll ask yourself that question as well if you find yourself getting a bit too complacent about how well things might be going in your own life. This is one of my favorite photographs in the world. This is Emma Solkowitz again, that young woman from Columbia. What I love about this picture is that her friends on the day of graduation, literally stepping into her shoes, helping her carry her burden across that graduation stage on the final day, that she carried that mattress. A demonstration that when we are together fighting for a cause, we truly can make change. Voting, such an important part of how we use our voices. And of course, young people who have been willing to get engaged and who have been elected to office in this country at an incredibly young age to use their voices to try to impact change. When we're reminded of this picture and those particular shoes, it's interesting to look at the court today <laughs> and of course to see what's different. I can't imagine history without the women and some of the men here who are part of this particular <laughs> court. But I think it's instructive to look and see how our younger voters or would-be voters are using or not using their voices in the political arena today. You see your line, your, the yellow line there. This is the presidential year turnout over time. A little bit of a rise when people got excited about President Obama's first election in 2008. 
But what's most instructive about this chart is not just the percentage or lack of percentage of voting within our younger population, but the dramatically larger percentage of voters in folks who are old, like me. Our voices tend to be disproportionately recognized in the political arena, and as a consequence of that, you hear candidates speaking to issues that are representative, perhaps, of older folks' concerns, but are disproportionately skewed in that direction. And I know a lot of our younger people may feel like things that matter to them aren't being talked about by politicians. But keep in mind, politicians who feel they don't need to be concerned about what your perspectives might be because they aren't seeing your opinions showing up. The millennial midterms uh, turnout, midterm election turnout, is even more stark. Um, as you can see here, the data that we have going back to 2010 shows just a little over a 20% turnout in the eligible voting population of our millennial voters. And again, those older folks like me turning out in much larger percentages. But there is such incredible hope here, and I have so much optimism in the power of our young voters to use their voices and the very um, real impact they could have, not only on the outcome of elections, but obviously the outcome on policymaking in this country in a way that could make such a dramatic and important difference. In 2008, millennial voters occupied 20% of the eligible voting population. In just four years, by 2020, it's predicted that millennials will occupy 40% of the eligible voting population in this country. Imagine what we might see if there was incredible turnout, for example, in this presidential race and in 2018 in the midterm elections in terms of what politicians might begin to feel they're going to be held accountable to and what we might hear them speak to if you were to show up in numbers that reflect your percentages. You, of course, do have the power to change the world. And I am so hopeful when I consider the perspectives and the passions that I see in our young people. And I hope that we will see those conversations in social media and elsewhere that evidence such an incredible awareness, an incredible compassion for others that our young people tend to represent. I'm so excited about seeing that reflected in our public conversation at the most important place that we speak, that of course being at the ballot box. Thank you so very, very much for having me on your campus today. And I am happy to take questions. I think we have uh, about 25 minutes left in our time together. And I would love to answer any questions that you have. in taking questions, if you raise your hands, we have mics um, that will be coming around to you. Hi, uh, hi Senator Davis. My name hi. is Fez. I'm a fourth semester uh, MPH student. Before anything else, my mom says hello. <laughs> uh, uh, I, you know, as a young person, it's very easy to become disillusioned by the political landscape of this country, yeah. but your filibuster in, in 2013 was, was inspiring stuff, and I want to say thank you for that. You were officially now one of my two favorite Southern Democrats. Frank Underwood is the second. <laughs> <laughs> I do have a question for you, and I'm afraid, uh, I'm deathly afraid it's going to come off as being a slightly antagonistic, although it's not meant to be, and I hope you'll extend to me the uh, benefit of, of the doubt. Um, again, looking at the political landscape in this country, uh, I'm afraid that restrictive abortion laws are not going to go away. It seems like one gets struck down, another one uh, seems to pop up, which is why I think it's important for women in this country to be financially empowered so that they can elect women who can do right by women in instead of entrusting that responsibility to, as you said, privileged white men. Uh, that's why I was slightly disappointed when you decided to endorse Secretary Clinton for the presidency of the United States. Um, just to uh, disclaimer, I think she'd be, uh, anyone on that, this side of the aisle would be a great president 
as opposed to what's happening on the other side. We won't talk about that. <laughs> um, but I, I feel that Secretary Clinton will be uh, great for, uh, uh, for women in this country, but I'm afraid she will only be great for privileged women in this country, which is why I think uh, Senator Sanders' <laughs> agenda for income equality is, is more congruent with liberal agenda, and from what I see, and I don't want to impute this on you, but your agenda as well. So uh, I, I was wondering what your, what your opinion was on that, that, you know, yeah, I guess I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I, I want to start out by fully agreeing with you on uh, something that you started with, and that is that on the progressive side of the aisle, I'm a Democrat, I'll admit that. I know this conversation isn't meant to be a political, partisan conversation, uh, but I think that we're well situated, no matter whom comes out of that field. We've got some really good thinking, um, intelligent, wonderful people who are running to be our next president. I'm 52 years old, and I've been around long enough to watch Hillary Clinton in action for many, many years. And I'll tell you the experience that left the most indelible impression with me about her, and it's been nothing but reassured and reinforced ever since then. It was in 2009 when she was speaking before the House Foreign Affairs Committee, and a congressperson there was trying to put her on the spot about President Obama's administration's position on women's reproductive rights around the globe, and also her role in that as Secretary of State. She gave the most remarkable, forceful, intelligent, and passionate defense of why that was important. And what I know about her as a woman, being a woman myself, and a woman who's about to have my very first grandchild, who is a granddaughter in April, is that she is going to wake up every day fighting for the rights that so very much matter to us. And I know she's going to do that across the board because, again, her life experiences have demonstrated it. When she and Bill Clinton were young, they gained their first experience in organizing in the Rio Grande Valley in Texas, where they were working to try to empower a disempowered community there. Her first job was with the Children's Defense Fund, where she was working on behalf of creating a better world for children. And I just happen to believe that she brings the kind of experience, and I do trust her passion for people of all backgrounds to serve us incredibly well in our presidency. Though I do want to say this. I think the message that Senator Sanders is delivering is such an important message. And as is always the case in political conversations, debate tends to make us all think better, make us demand more, and that's what should happen of our candidates in the ideal political world. And I'm thrilled to see that so many young people are excited about coming out and voting, whether it's for him or for her. And honestly, even if it's on the other side of the aisle, because making sure that the voices of young people are heard is, for me, the most important part of the equation. And that really is what's going to advance us as a country and get us, I think, unstuck from where we are right now. So thank you. I'm glad you're involved, and I'm very happy you're supporting Senator Sanders. Yes. Yes. Hi. Um, Hi. So I am also an MSW MPH person. Hi, Maddie. Um, and I actually worked um, at Safe Place in Austin when you were doing all of your good stuff in rape crisis. So that was huge for us. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for your work there. Yeah. Um, I guess my question is specifically about HB2, just because that's the scariest stuff I've ever seen, even having grown up in Texas and having been around that stuff my whole life and been around that political climate, um, and I just kind of wondered what your thoughts were given um, the Supreme Court case coming up, and what, yeah. I mean, what are we supposed to do for, you know, if it goes wrong or if it goes badly for us? I'm going to remain nothing but optimistic about that Supreme Court well, what decision. What can we do now then? <laughs> <laughs> and I will tell you what you've effectively done already. I want to go back to this slide. Remember when Debbie Wasserman Schultz said a couple of days that 
what did she say, young women are complacent, I think was the word she used. Young women are anything but complacent, anything but. I mean, you were in Texas working at the Safe Haven, a, a rape crisis center, as a young woman because you're working to try to improve the lives of other people. If you look at this photo and if you have a chance to look at it close up or some of the crowds that were there that day and that showed up the following Monday when we had a big rally out on the lawn of the Texas Capitol, so many young people there, particularly young women who were involved in exercising their voices. As part of the Supreme Court case, the Whole Woman's Health case, which is the Texas abortion law that is going to be heard in March, the Center for Reproductive Rights worked very hard to make sure that the justices would not be able to make this opinion in a vacuum, in the abstract about their uh, professed principles about abortion rights and the constitutionality of that, but instead to force them to see this through the lens of real people, the idea of putting their feet into the shoes of women who have faced these decisions historically so that they have a better understanding of why this right is so very precious and so very important in terms of upholding it. They filed 65 amicus briefs in that particular case. I was one of them. I shared my abortion story in that particular brief, as did so many other women in the other briefs that were filed to push back against the idea that Justice Kennedy actually expressed in a prior opinion about women who regret their abortions. Many women, most women do not regret their abortions and we wanted to make sure that he understood our personal experiences behind that. I say that just as way of example of helping to encourage you when we find ourselves working on issues that are difficult and things that we are either trying to change or to prevent from being changed. Making sure that we bring our personal experiences forward is a tremendously important part of how we effectuate those changes that we want to see. And going back to the example that I started with, with Earl Warren, had it not been for his unique capacity to encourage his fellow justices to see things through the lenses of other people's experiences, we wouldn't have had Brown versus Board of Education. We'd be a very different country today. It would have happened probably at some point, but it would have been much longer in, in coming. So I'm encouraged. I think the Supreme Court decision is going to go our way. And I think in large part, that's because of people like you and so many other people who have been willing to step up and speak out and be a part of helping to make change. Yes. So um, my name's Paola, and I'm actually from the RGB area. And um, so growing up there, as you had mentioned, the climate is very rough for people who do not um, agree with their surroundings. And um, <laughs> all the way through high school, I had this um, belief that I wanted to go into politics to try and change that. and. Uh, after about three years of doing it, I got very overwhelmed by how difficult it was yes. and stepped off it for a while, I'm ashamed to say. And um, after five years of being up here in Boston and three of those years being in journalism, I decided in this most recent year that I want to go back to Texas and try that out again. And um, excellent. just sort of wanted to know, and I know you probably get this very cliche question all the time, but um, when you decide to take on Texas in terms <laughs> of all of that, how did you, I guess, persevere is the question. You find your perseverance through your passion for justice in the world, I think. That's certainly where I find mine. I wrote an essay not long ago for Lena Dunham's newsletter, Lenny. Do you read Lenny? Um, I think it's a, a fantastic um, curated newsletter that she puts together. And I wrote about losing the gubernatorial election. And I wrote about how very much I hate to lose. <laughs> But I also talked about the value in trying to do hard things. And even if we can't see it immediately, 
the impact that we have in slowly forcing change by virtue of the fact that we're stepping up, we're committing our voices, and we're working to make that change. When you look at what happened in marriage equality, it feels like it happened very fast, right? Because all of a sudden the whole country was against it, and then suddenly here we are. But there was so much work that went into that, years and years and years, and we see that in so many areas of civil rights work, and I'm sure in the public health arena as well, where we were provided some very interesting statistics by the dean last night about how things are skewed in, in such a, an incorrect direction in that regard. The best that we can each do is bring our voices and our energy and our passion forward toward working on a change. And cumulatively and ultimately, it really does come about. And it's surprising how few voices sometimes it can take to actually be the shift that occurs. I use my own state as an example. When Senator Ted Cruz was elected there, he was elected in a state of 27 million people with over 14 million eligible voters by less than a million. I think it was somewhere around the 700,000 people range. Those few people made a decision about who was going to reflect and represent the interests of our state, but they aren't, as you know, coming from the Rio Grande Valley, reflective of the population as a whole. And the only way to change that, truly, is for us to believe in our own power, one by one by one by one, and that added together, it actually can create a change. Another great example of that is looking at the fundraising of Senator Bernie Sanders. So many people are giving $5 and $10 to him. The same thing happened for me in my particular campaign. And I'm sure that when people write that check, they think, my $5 is not going to make a difference. But when hundreds of thousands of people write a $5 check or a $10 check, cumulatively, we really can have an impact. And I would encourage everyone in the audience, whether we are young or not so young, to consider the importance and the value of each of us showing up and expressing our voices when it comes time for us to have the opportunity and the privilege of voting, because we will and can, we can and will make a change if we do that. And thank you so much for committing yourself and your energy and your passion to trying to make a difference. I'm really proud of you. Yes. Hi, Senator. Um, Hi. I'm originally from Houston, Texas. I've lived in Massachusetts for almost 39 years. Uh, I'm a true Texas expat who has <laughs> morphed from a Texas Republican to a liberal Democrat, <laughs> um, where I'm much more at home now. You actually touched on an issue that I had wanted to raise, which was not only the lower voting rates among millennials, but also lower voting rates, lower voter registration and participation from our black and Hispanic uh, citizens. My ears perked up a couple of years ago when I heard that in Texas, there was a huge voter registration drive going on, realizing that if those communities voted in the same proportions as older white voters, that Texas could actually become a blue state. No question. And I wonder if you could talk about the effort in Texas and maybe nationally to uh, make that a reality. There is a, a very strong effort underway in Texas. And our campaign, of course, contributed toward that effort as well. And we did register a record number of people there. Sometimes what we find is a disconnect between getting people registered and getting them to do the very next really important part, which is to show up and, and vote. But let's keep in mind that there are reasons that that voting sometimes doesn't occur. And there are very um, focused and concentrated efforts in trying to keep it from occurring. In Texas right now, uh, we are under what's considered the most difficult voter ID law in the country. And in fact, that particular case is before the Supreme Court in this cycle as well. That law, the state admitted, disenfranchised at least 600,000 eligible legal voting citizens in our state when it was passed because they did not have the qualifying photo IDs in order to be able to vote. 
And it really has become the modern day version of the poll tax because in order to get that qualifying photo, you've got to have your birth certificate, which means you're going to have to write a 20 to $25 check, which for some re people truly is um, a, a block for them in being able to exercise their voices. We've also seen uh, an attempt to quiet as much as possible the voices of our growing demography through 20 years of redistricting in the state of Texas, which isn't just happening there, but it's happening particularly um, severely there. And it's created a dynamic that has suppressed vote because if I live in a district, a congressional district, for example, that has been stacked so heavily to favor a Republican, and I get passionate about a candidate, and I go and I vote, and I find that I fail, it can knock the wind out of your sails, and it can tend to do what this young woman talked about a moment ago and make you feel as though you really can't make a difference if you show up. And it's hard to combat that feeling, but it's incumbent upon us, I think, to continue to push back for voting rights. It's one of the most important decisions that this next president is going to make, the likely appointment of perhaps up to three, maybe even more Supreme Court justices in the, the very near future, unwinding the prior decision that pulled back on voting rights protections by this Supreme Court, and helping to actively change the way people are able to exercise their voices is the most important thing that we can do to really begin to see changes in places like Texas. And I was pleased to hear President Obama talk about that in his um, State of the Union speech the other day, and he said it so well that we've got to stop this system where candidates are choosing their voters as opposed to voters choosing their candidates. Senator, we have time for one very short question. I think he meant I need to give a short answer. <laughs> and as you can tell, I have a hard time with that. So I don't see any hands, so let me ask that final question. Could you talk briefly about the importance, <laughs> about the importance of compromise? Because as we talk about the things that you are <coughs> encouraging us to be very much a part of, it involves working with many people, no which question. involves the importance of compromise. Could you talk about that as your final um, response to us, please? Absolutely. I, in my experience in the Texas Senate, some of the best work that we did came because we worked across the aisle with each other and got some things done. And we learn to give and take with each other. And in a, an ideal world, that is what happens. We do have people that represent different perspectives that come to the table, and we come up with a better result because of that. In places like Texas, though, we see that certainly threatened again because of redistricting, which has created a climate where primary elections have become where the real electoral contests are held. We're getting more and more uh, extreme in the candidates that are running and that are being elected because of that environment. And we're coming to a place where there is less and less room for compromise. And you probably hear it as well as I do in my state, compromise has gotten a bad name, that somehow we're uh, not being uh, true to our values where we compromise to try to move something forward. It is such an essential part of democracy. And my hope is that we can elect people who have the courage to continue to work in that way and that we give them the ability to have that courage by addressing some of these issues like the gerrymandering that's going on. Thank you so much. Thank you very, very much. Great to be with you. Thank you.